Welcome to the Campground Catalyst Podcast, the show dedicated to fueling success in outdoor hospitality. Whether you're an outdoor adventurer, a campground owner, or looking to build your legacy in outdoor hospitality, you're right where you need to be. We're here to guide you through the fascinating world of campground management, unique real estate strategies, and the gratifying opportunities created by outdoor hospitality. Our mission is to inspire and equip you with the knowledge and insights you need to build a successful business and create a legacy worth leaving. The Campground Catalyst podcast is proudly sponsored by Beyonder Camp, your trusted outdoor hospitality experts. Subscribe now, join our active online community, and let's ignite our passions and potential together. All right. Hello and welcome back to the Campground Catalyst podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Adam Lendy. Uh, with me, Justin Hoggett, Don Spafford, Robert Earl. What's going on, fellas? Hey, hey. You know, well, watching that intro was pretty impressive. You, you know, the campground is a two-lane road through the park. I'm like, man, that is a nice cement campground. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're bringing you back in for another episode. This is part of our Campfire Cash Flow segment, of course, for real estate professionals, those who are looking to get into the space, whether it's as an investment or to own and operate their first campground. Uh, today is a topic that I especially love, which is how to find campgrounds that are for sale. Um, you know, this is how we really built our business. Um, I was parlaying some experience I had from other forms of real estate into our venture when we started Beyonder camp and uh, actually camp, happy camper capital that preceded that and buying campgrounds. Uh, so really uh, excited to jump in. But, uh, you know, Justin was our, you know, was my first partner in uh, lead generating for these campgrounds. And we had some uh, many afternoons and evenings sitting around smiling and dialing, calling campground owners. And, uh, you know, we're going to share a few of our favorite ways to find campgrounds for sale, because the only way to do it is not to go through brokers. That's one option, but it's certainly not the only way to do it. Um, let's go around the room first, though, because I know we are all in the environment, you know, when you're in the business, people are sending these to you all the time. You know, what do you guys see as your favorite way to get in front of these opportunities and who's bringing, or where, where are the best deals? Boy, we should all jump yeah. at the same best time. Deals. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll go here. So I, I'm not in the direct acquisition site, but I'm not the one necessarily dialing up campgrounds. Um, but, uh, you know, I am out there. People know me on, on social media that uh, I'm in the campground business. Uh, and so because of that, people know who I am and what Beyonder does, I get campgrounds sent to me all the time from people. Either uh, they have a friend that has a campground, they know somebody that's selling it, uh, some brokers, but mostly just uh, you know people as they, they on their own come across opportunities uh, and they kind of at least know our, our criteria somewhat, they'll they'll send, send them over or if somebody else posts something on social media, they have a campground for sale, they'll tag me on it, uh, say, hey, Don, is this going to work for you? You know, so, so uh, you know, no matter, even if you are actively searching or, or whatever you're doing, letting people know what you're looking for is, is a, easy way just to have people that be your network for you and go fish and find properties that bring your way. They may not all be good for sure, but uh, at least it, it, you know, helps get your name out there and people know what you're looking for to send you opportunities as they come up. Yeah. And, and Adam, I think you need to hold up your prop. Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. You're gonna, we're, yeah. You're gonna, well, we're okay, getting there. Fine. So, so we, we um, obviously started out by smiling down, right? And do we have mentioned it in the show before? Let's see. Is he, uh, <laughs> well, we'll let him talk about that. But uh, but the point is, talking to people, we've talked about uh, when you call a campground, people love to talk about their property. It is so easy to get um, the potential sellers on the phone because they're just excited. You know, hey, this is my park. This is what I've done with it because they're so invested into it. And it's so much fun calling people. Uh, Adam, as you mentioned before, um, off air, you know, we've got when you call residential people to try to sell their house, they're like, don't call me, you know, they get all angry. And, and then you call a campground person and a seller, potential seller, and they're just so happy. And, and that's, that's a lot of joy. Um, brokers bring a lot of opportunities, you know, getting, get in front of all your brokers, not just one, you might have a favorite, that's cool. But uh, brokers can bring you a lot of different deals. But uh, in reality, a lot of times they mark up the price. So it's maybe not the best deal. It's harder to kind of negotiate as well. They become a middleman. They get in the, I'll say they get in the way. I'm sorry, all the brokers out there, but uh, I like to deal directly with the sellers and um, let's work out a deal. Let's talk about the specifics. Let's just get to the meat of it. You know, we don't need to go back and forth. So um, <clears throat> yeah, just being on as many lists as you can really. Um, but yeah, Adam. Robert, how about you? Or Robert? 
I'd never like to say that I was a broker when I was selling real estate because I never wanted the word broke associated with my name. And when you're talking about getting all of these uh, campgrounds that are coming in, uh, I had an army uh, uh, colonel way back in the day who became a general, and he would tell me with this much in the room, there's got to be a pony somewhere. So I cleaned it up for, for this, but uh, you're going to gonna see a lot of it. I, I, number one source uh, so far, uh, well, two of them, uh, my father-in-law, um, I love that he bird dogs and sends properties out there. Uh, shout out to Dick Davis uh, for giving me the uh, leads that come into it. But uh, for me, uh, the sources that came was from the camp count campground owners expo uh this year that's going to be held in branson uh missouri in the december time frame uh join our patreon community we'll get you connected with that group uh even if you're not a campground owner uh going to that expo and being able to talk to others is a, a great opportunity or uh, partnering with a company like beyonder so for me uh the that's been uh the conversations that we started last year at coe have been uh, some of the best uh, sources that we've had so far. Yeah, perfect. You know, when, when we got into this space, this was a new asset of real estate for us. You know, as Justin mentioned, I had experience in residential real estate before doing brokerage. I was aligned with a big name brokerage that uh, is well known for making a lot of phone calls. Um, you know, so what I did, you know, I, I kind of had it in me already that I was going to be calling people to get in front of these opportunities. But that said, you know, when we first got started in it, Justin was finding different brokers out there to interact with and getting listings from them. And, you know, what we quickly found is that, you know, you have a certain you have a very finite number of listings that these brokers can get and you have a very large pool of buyers and it's just a feeding frenzy. Just picture the piranhas all in there trying to eat up that deal and end up, you know, it oftentimes overbidding these properties to get them way too high to where they didn't make any sense anymore. Um, you know, or it was just, you really had a very select number of properties and some of them were turds, you know, let's just say that's, that some of them were not great properties. So, um, you know, the, the second thing I found early on is as we were researching, getting education on how to buy campgrounds was some of the online groups. Um, if you go on Facebook, there are a number of groups, RV parks for sale, campgrounds for sale, all these groups, kind of a similar thing though, which you came and you, once you join the group, you'd see some listings come up and then you really realize if you scroll back, that person had been pasting that same dang listing in for six months, a year, two years, whatever the case is, you know, and people actually start commenting, oh, you're still trying to sell that place, you know, and, and you, we, of course, you, you know, looked at these opportunities and they weren't typically great. You know, there were every now and again, a, a good one came up, but for the most part, a lot of them weren't. So for me, I quickly said, well, I need to get in front of my own opportunities. I don't want to de be dealing with other properties that I'm competing with other people. So we need to get off market leads. Um, you know, we were campers already at the time and, you know, we're we're familiar with um, a, a an organization that puts together a publication on campgrounds. Uh, I'll show it on the camera for those who are in our YouTube or watching the video recording. Um, but this is the cheapest set of leads you're ever going to get. The thing is, they are not all interested sellers yet. You know, you have to make that conversion happen for them. But you can see here on this book, twelve thousand something leads for eight bucks. You know, that was the best deal uh, we found at the time. So this is where Justin and I started. We each bought a copy of that guidebook and we sat down and, you know, the great thing with this too is campground owners get to determine what their listings in here say. And they'd actually put in the number of sites they have, how many of them were, you know, full hookup, how many of them were pull through. Not like the camper cares, but it was really good for us to have that intel when we were calling them to talk about their campgrounds. If, you know, if it was too small, we just screened it out right away. But yeah, Justin alluded to it earlier. You know, when I used to call, uh, uh, on for sale by owners or expired listings in the residential space. Um, well, Robert used to do this too. You know, did, was there any name you didn't get called, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got called every one of them, and you had to have a, a comeback for every one of them, and and be very thick skin. But yes, in in the case of the campground owners, they're 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 either busy. Uh, that's one aspect of it. So you have to make sure that you get through the layers of your call on the front desk and be able to get through to them. Um, but when you do get them on the line, they do really want to call. And I, I'm glad you did actually show the book because uh, when I first met you guys, it sounded like you had gone through the uh, Sears Roebuck catalog. You know, it was uh, you were dating yourself a little bit as to what you were doing. I would have done it online. But uh, yeah, the book works. Uh, get the highlighter out and uh, start uh, dialing away. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and to Robert's Robert's point there, don't call on a Saturday when they're super busy. You know, maybe midweek might be an easier time to, to get a hold of the owner, right? 
Yeah, and we talk about this a lot in our course, our RV Destination Mastery course that we sell at uh, happycamperuniversity.com, which is linked up in the show notes um, on, you know, your strategies for this, you know, because you do need to go and you, you really have to have a plan when you go on the call. Because again, you're going to be calling a business number and their business number, they're expecting you to be a camper or somebody who's, you know, calling to make a reservation. You know, just like calling a home, if they perceive it to be a sales call that doesn't bring them value, they're probably going to want to get you off the phone. Now that said, if you do it right and you approach with, if you lead with the right script, yes, you need to be scripted when you go into this, um, you know, you can build rapport and, you know, Justin mentioned, of course, you know, obviously, you know, I, I used to get hung up on all the time, you know, calling people to try to get them to sell their houses, but campground owners, boy, I'll tell you, once you get them talking, you almost have to make an excuse to get off the phone. You know, they're, they're the salt of the earth. I mean, nice people to talk to. They want to tell you about their business they built. They're proud of what they've made and they want to tell you all about it. You know, there, there were times when I'd be on the phone for 20, 30 minutes and have to say, gosh, you know what? Uh, I'd love to keep talking to you, but I got to go right now. You know, I'd have to, you know make an excuse to get off the phone and then set an appointment for a later follow-up. But uh, it ended up being very effective for us. You know, we bought multiple properties that we found off market that way. And of course, the big opportunity in that is that we are not competing with anybody else. We don't have a broker in their ear trying to tell them that it's worth more in order to get a listing agreement signed. Yes, that happens. You know, you they'll, they'll think their property is worth something and a broker will let them believe it's worth more just to get them to sign on the paper and then you know, plan to be, you know, bringing that listing price down over time. Um, you know, so you, you get in front of this virgin opportunity with this person who hasn't had anybody, is untainted, so to speak, doesn't have anybody else competing. You can build a great relationship. You can come up with some really creative terms on a contract. You don't have a broker telling, well, that's not standard. That's not how business is done. And, you know, you can get things done in a different way. Um, you know, we've had a couple of great successes in our history like that. But, uh, you know, th that's uh, my number one favorite way still today is getting on the phone and calling these folks. Um, you know, I, we've evolved our strategies a little bit over time. You know, we've certainly worked some technology tools in. Um, you know, we've got a great tool that uh, we came up with at Beyonder actually that is beneficial for both campground owners and us, you know, that we call our CARES assessment system, which is where campground owners can go get a health report of their property. It gives us a chance to take a peek at their property. And if they've signaled in there that they have an interest in potentially selling it, then we get the chance to look at it through that lens. But we don't come at them with any sales pitch, any anything harder than what they've asked for. We give them the report. We give them what we think their property's worth is just an opinion of value. It's not even an offer. If they like that opinion of value and they they want to sell it to us at that price, then we're happy to entertain that conversation. But, you know, that's something that we have evolved in our strategies with. But the point is, you got to you got to find these opportunities, got to get creative, because the best deals are not generally sitting in your broker listings, again, unless you want to overpay for a property. So, yeah, and property values is, uh, is one thing here where you, um, you know, you've got the, like you said, the broker in their ear, right? This isn't necessarily about finding a campground, but it is about closing on a campground. And when you have a broker in your ear about a, about a evaluation that they think might get you to sign that paper, you know, it becomes a lot harder for, I think, anyone to purchase the property because then you, you've, you know, taken away their money if uh, they close on anything less than what the broker has promised them, right? And then, you know, how many deals have we provided what we thought was a good offer they go, uh, you know, go, you know, go away. And uh, the nice words there. And, uh, <laughs> and then we find out later that they were within like a hundred thousand of our offer, you know, when they finally did close many months later. And it's, you know, sometimes it's the, the first one to the table is, is the one that gets told no and go away, but it's also an opportunity, right? We can follow up with them, maintain a relationship, build the rapport. Like there is an opportunity. If you know you want that property, just stay with it. You know, you probably would, would end up with a, with a better price. And then another hurdle that I, I see with, with some of these is, uh, is the size of the property. So we're, we're talking about, you know, we looked through good Sam, we, we filtered out a lot of them, you know, we can, we can, uh, call, you know, the 10 to, I don't know, I'm just numbers here, but 10 to 50 site RV parks, those, those sellers are way more involved or, or potential sellers, the owners, uh, and they're, they're probably manning the phones a little bit more. You get into the hundred to 200 sites, the, the, the staffing seems to change a little bit, might be a little bit harder to find the owners. And then you find like the institutional properties, 500 plus up to, I mean, I know Adam, you called some in Arizona that were like 4,000 sites or something. Like it is almost impossible to get a seller on the phone. And that's more of an institutional property. Gonna be a much harder to find that seller. But, um, you know, obviously that's a lot more expensive property as well. I don't know, you know, how many buyers 
are looking for those necessarily. But um, just a, a word of caution when you are trying to find that seller, it might take a little bit more work depending on the size of the property. Absolutely. That, sm uh, that smaller size property is going to be very difficult for you to get the staffing for because you're not making enough income. You're not doing enough to cover your expenses from that standpoint. So you have to know your own criteria going into it as well, uh, because what you're really doing there is you're not making an investment, you're buying a job. And uh, some of these Facebook uh, uh, groups, you see that as to, well, I've got 10 sites, I've got 15 sites, I'm gonna add, I'm expanding, I'm gonna add in three more sites. Well, that three more sites, sure, that, that helps their own particular income or it may help from that standpoint but it's not going to get you additional staff it's not going to not something you can retire on let's put it that way uh, as to what you're looking for so having your criteria um, another way of finding campgrounds uh, being a full-time RVer is uh, going into the campground and you're doing your immediate due diligence has the property been upkept uh, is it showing conditions that it needs a cash infusion or it needs a, a breath of fresh air uh, uh, that may be a, a target or an opportunity for uh, you to uh, get in touch with the owner and make a uh, offer on. Also, the staff will give away all their secrets. If you if you buddy up with the staff long enough, they're going to talk. Uh, they're going to tell you where the, uh, shall we say, where the bodies are buried, and you'll have a little bit more of the information uh, to find out whether or not that's a ideal target. Yeah, you mentioned two things there, Robert, I want to tie back to. First is obviously the criteria. Definitely have those established ahead of time. Because like you said, obviously, you could be buying yourself a job or you just need to know what it is that's going to fit your own goals and your lifestyle that you're looking to achieve. And then what you can do is if you want to employ those brokers, treat them as a passive means of lead generation. Give them your criteria and say, I don't want every deal you have. I want you to bring deals that fit these, check these boxes right here. And now forget about the brokers. Go actually pound the pavement, go find the properties and let them come to you if they have a deal, but don't rely on them to be your only source of getting those leads. Uh, the second thing Robert mentioned, I think is worth uh, considering is pop-ins. You know, now pop-ins can be really tough in our business because campgrounds are spread so far apart. It's not like, you know, door knocking, you know, for residential real estate where you had, you know, 20 houses on a block that you could walk in, you know, a short period of time. We're talking, you know, hundreds of miles sometimes between campgrounds. So uh, with that said, if you have a particular area you're targeting, it may be worth it to take a trip, get a rental car and go drive around. We know a broker who does that and walks away from everyone on those trips with multiple listings. So, you know, it's, it's an opportunity you have as well too. You can go take a tour, take a vacation, you know, double some uh, personal and, and business together to get out and actually visit these campgrounds. Getting face to face with an owner is absolutely worth it. You know, every one of our properties after we get under contract that we're looking to buy, we make a trip out to meet the owner. And that relationship, that time on property with them, looking them eye to eye, shaking their hand, uh, goes a long way. Don, I think you had something you were about to say. I jumped on you there. Oh, you're fine. You're kind of covered. I was going to go off what Robert said, uh, you know, being at the campground. Uh, a lot of these, the, the mom and pop will say owned campgrounds. The owners themselves go out there every day and go get to meet their guests and hang out with them, you know, and, and make friends really. You know, so, so like Robert was saying, that uh, could be a great way to go out there and get face to face with the owner, strike a, strike up a, a conversation, just talk about their, their campground, how great it is, and you know, and then bring up. By the way, have you ever thought about selling it? You know, or you know, and kind of get into that. You know, work your way into that versus just being a, a stranger on the phone call that they can hang up on, right? Um, you know, if you're you're right there with them, shaking hands, you know, sharing a drink together, then. Uh, they're more more likely to open up and, and talk to you about their business and, and uh, you know and of course understand that again this is probably their baby right they they may have a lot more uh, sentimental value there than what uh, you want to place on it as a business but uh, but uh, if you can get on their good side and uh, you know make them feel like you're their buddy uh, then uh, they may be more willing to uh, be you know fluctuate on their their pricing somewhat yeah. Absolutely. You know, there's other sort of lead generation levers I'm going to throw out there as well. Um, these are ones that, you know, have their place, uh, but it just depends on your appetite and your budget. Um, you know, some of those can be sending letters, um, you know, or, or mailers out. Uh, we know people in the space who do postcard mailings. Um, you know, the trouble is that can get really expensive. You know, if you're sending this out to four or 5,000 campgrounds in, an, in a part of the country and you've got to find a service that might do it for 50 cents a piece, 
40 cents a piece, you know, you're potentially talking thousands of dollars to spend on that. And what's your return rate going to be? You know, if you don't do your design just right, you know that 90% of those are going in the trash without even being looked at. You know, it's just something you have to consider going into it. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing handwritten letters as a follow-up after you've spoken with somebody. But as an initial outreach, I just, I don't know if the conversion's right there, especially if you're somebody who's getting into this with a very skinny budget. Um, I think, I think you're, you know, spending eight bucks on a book like this and investing a few hours a day on the phone, calling these folks is going to pay dividends um, far greater than your postcard mailers could. Um, I've heard of people doing social media posts and advertising. Again, that can be a very, very high dollar spend for a potentially very, very low, low conversion uh, because you're going to have to have the right message to catch the interest of somebody who may not be thinking about selling their business. You know, so you may be noise if you don't have the right message going by. Um, you know, like I said, so I, I'm going to advocate personally for if you want to do this, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, super secret tr trick that we're going to share in here with you today other than put in the work, you know, get roll up your sleeves and actually get down to business. What do you guys think? Did I miss hey, anything? Adam, Any other? Hey, hey, Adam, I'll sell you a list. How many emails do we get like that a day? And they're, and, uh, they're not targeted. They don't have the criteria. Uh, the other aspect of social media is it's very, very difficult to uh, target. I think LinkedIn would be more of an opportunity uh, because you can at least narrow down uh, that they're in the outdoor hospitality industry. Um, but having your, your ads would be very, very difficult to uh, be able to get that particular target. Um, I know we're gonna talk about this on other episodes as well, but you also have to know yourself uh, regarding seasonality so your criteria is not just the size of the park but where, where do you want to end up or where do you want to service uh, shall we say and uh, some of these parks there's some great opportunities we came across at COE uh, that are just uh, south of the Canadian border if not uh, north of it is what it sounded like as far as uh, they're snowed in for five months out of the year uh, what are they going to do in the other portion of it and what are you going to do income wise uh, during that period of time and during that part of the year robert you mentioned the list and i was going to mention that too because the uh previous marketing partner we had provided a big list and, and it sounded great you know we're like perfect and this might be easier than than our book because we it is on excel or whatever format that you can sort it and pivot table whatever you like on the on the property and uh, I was not directly involved, but feedback from one of our acquisitions guy was that more than half the data was junk. And so, you know, how much time did he waste trying to go through that? Um, so that didn't work out, but it is possible that there's some better list out there. I don't know, but um, something to look into. Uh, and then Adam, another method is, you know, more along the lines of online websites. And, and we started uh, by uh, RV Park Store, which was one of the websites that we we visited. There's Crexy, LoopNet, like a lot of different avenues for some of these brokers that have a lot of listings. Um, but you can just check those. Those are, um, you know, again, usually broker deals. They're not necessarily um, for sale by owner. I think RV Park Store does have a little bit more of that. But um, an opportunity to just um, set your criteria. You can set search parameters. You can have it email you directly. I get emails all the time about available properties based on those lists. But again, a lot of them are broker lists, and, and um, you know, I'd prefer the seller, you know, uh, option. Yeah, good point. And there is a, it, it's a hard to discern difference too with some of these services Justin's mentioning. You know, some of these are just, you know, real estate listing sites. Others are um, brokerages and some of them are what I call marketing services. So the difference between a marketing service and a broker is this, the broker is providing representation to the seller. So don't, mis just don't mistake that. They're not representing you, the buyer. They're representing the seller. So if you don't come in with your own support, you've got a master negotiator in their corner whose objective it is to get that price up as high as they can and get the terms as favorable to the seller as possible. You know, they're not there looking to necessarily protect your best interest. They're going to be, they're going to treat you fair and legally, but you know, they've got an obligation to that seller. Um, you know, whereas the marketing services, typically these are guys who aren't actually licensed brokers, or if they are, they aren't 
representing the sellers in such a way that they are providing that um, service to them, they'll typically have to disclose which it is, which one or the other they're providing. So that's not just something to keep in mind going into this. Some of those marketing agencies, as I call them, they're truly just taking the seller's information and putting it on their website, putting it in their print publications. They're not giving them any representation. So just know what you're going into and prepare for that accordingly. If you are with a broker, it's going to be in your best interest to have some sort of representation or expertise in your corner um, because that's going to be, again, you're going to be dealing with somebody who's a lot more experienced than you. Um, so a minimum an attorney, um, if not another broker yourself or a partner who's got an extensive amount of experience in uh, real estate acquisitions. Um, you know, really, of course, you know, always good to go in with a real estate attorney uh, because these contracts, if you're, if you're buying your first campground, the contracts you're going to be working with are different than your standard residential contracts. Most states have a cookie cutter, boilerplate residential contract that you pretty much check the boxes. Um, these commercial deals, I'll tell you what, they are typically a purchase and sale agreement that does not follow state uh, norms. We have our own contract at Beyonder that we use on when we purchase properties. We actually give a sample contract with the RV Destination Mastery course that you can use as a buyer that is specialized for our industry. You know, so it was expensive to make too. And it's been <laughs> expensive to maintain. So it, it's constantly growing and changing and evolving with all the different trends in the business and you know the, the, the changes we see needed. You know, I'll, I'll go back to our beginnings a little bit. Um, this was not a heavily sought after real estate asset when we first got into this space. You know, most of the people buying campgrounds at the time were retirees who were looking for their retirement gig. You know, they were selling their house and buying a campground with the proceeds from it. You know, and they were operating that in their retirement. And, you know, it wasn't as sophisticated as it is today um, with the operators out there, you know. So this is a lot more than just using a cookie cutter boilerplate uh, contract anymore. That wasn't even available when we got into this. We had to really customize this thing to make sure that we had RV property relevant language in there. You know, if you're buying a property in the northern half of the country that shuts down part of the year, having language in the contract that specifies that that owner is going to come back and help you shut down the park and or open the park because there's a very complex procedure to that and turning on the water and getting all the systems up and running for the year. And if you don't have that in your contract, you might be high and dry and not knowing where all the water shutoffs are. So yeah, good point well, about the marketing aspect of things. You know, why, why is that? Because you can't represent as a broker, uh, in another state, to, unless you're licensed in that state, right? But you have a lot of these national firms that are out there trying to secure these properties uh, for sale, and the only way to do that is by a marketing contract. And so, they're they're licensed to, they're not licensed, but they're they're contracted to list those properties and work with the buyer, potential buyer for those sellers. And that's why there's there's not typically a representation. Some some bigger firms will have national, uh, you know, regional guys that might be licensed in multiple states and they can truly act as a broker, but just be aware um, that they cannot actually give advice um, legally. They're just there to market it. And, and then sometimes they'll have documents that, hey, if this is a good example, uh, you might want to use this. You know, we've seen a lot of different contracts out there. Um, that's why we did create our own. Uh, you know, because we learned, we learned that, that that's not something we can necessarily trust, but, um, you know, p potentially an opportunity here for our Patreon community, like we're, we're all here to help and we can answer questions about what we feel is maybe a best idea on what to include in some of those contracts as well. Robert, do you have a closing thought over there? As a licensed agent, I'm going to say the number of people that don't realize that there's not a separate license for commercial versus residential. When the state licenses a real estate agent, they give them a license to sell real estate, period. And the specialty that is involved with residential, the specialty that's involved with condos, HOAs is completely different than commercial and then even within commercial. Just because you've listed an office building doesn't mean you know what's going on with the campground. I was smiling earlier for those on video because how many times do we have to educate the broker onto what to look for? There, I'll put my soapbox away. But as a, a licensed professional, I take some pride in that and, and I want to share and educate with others that uh, not all brokers are created equal. 
Absolutely. Good point. I can think of about three or four deals that we have particularly been negotiating in the past with a broker whose primary experience is residential. Yeah. And those are typically very, very difficult deals. And unfortunately, we have yet to have one that's actually panned out just because they don't necessarily have the experience and the understanding of the nuance of these of these contracts. You know, they're used to a contract that closes in 30 days and we're typically talking 120 days, you know, 90 if it's a really clean cut and easy to understand one. I mean, these are very very complex things and just getting the financing in place takes almost 90 days itself, you know, which they're just not frankly used to. So, you know, not there's anything wrong with that, but yeah, definitely if you if you're if you're working with a broker, look look out, look for who it is and, and who you might be potentially on the other side of a transaction with. Uh, just I'm gonna I'm gonna sum up the the bullet points here today uh, because of course we've mentioned this was tips for prospective buyers to find campgrounds for sale. Um, you guys know my number one top favorite is call them. Get them on the phone. It's the easiest way to get the, to in touch with the most people in the shortest amount of time and have the best chance of building a relationship. Uh, if you can't do that, and it, it pop in, visit them in person. You know, uh, Robert mentioned networking. He mentioned the Campground Owners Expo. There's the Outdoor Hospitality Conference and Expo. These are places that attract hundreds of campground owners from all over the country. You know, it's a chance to get in and meet these people in person. You know, those are my preferred ways. But of course, those are the active ways. You know, again, there's no easy button on this. There's no simple way to get in front of these things and have leads just fall in your lap. You got to put in the work. Otherwise, you're going to be relegated to the passive options, which are the ones that are coming to you and you have no control over. So if you're interested in this and you want to get a couple steps further or get our scripts for getting in front of campground owners, I recommend the RV Destination Mastery course at happycamperuniversity.com or just stay posted on this show long enough. Maybe we'll eventually give you some more secrets. So that's it for us today. Uh, join us on the Patreon community, of course, where we will answer your questions. And if you have a good enough question that merits a show topic, you may hear it on the air. Uh, thank you for joining us today. All right, guys. We'll see you. Good night. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Campground Catalyst podcast, where we take you behind the scenes in the fun and gratifying world of outdoor hospitality. We hope you were inspired by today's show and better equipped to take the next steps in your journey. Remember, you can continue the conversation and connect with fellow enthusiasts by visiting our website and joining the Campground Catalyst community on Patreon at campgroundcatalyst.com. There, Patreon members get exclusive access to special listener perks, they get their opportunity to engage with the host, and they get their questions answered on one of our future upcoming shows. The Campground Catalyst podcast is proudly sponsored by Beyonder Camp, your trusted partner in fueling your success in outdoor hospitality. Until next time, keep both your campfires and your passions burning.